The Super Nintendo holds a very special place in my heart. I absolutely love this console. I had one back in the day, played the crap out of it, and even though I had it and I had tons of games for it over the years, to this day I still discover more and more games that I either never heard of or I just didn't really give a chance to. So that's what I wanted to do today, is talk about a handful of games that I recently discovered or rediscovered and gave a shot to, played them, and really enjoyed them, want to recommend them you know maybe there's something here that you weren't aware of and now you might want to give it a chance so we got five games I want to talk about today that I finally played years later after the Super Nintendo was released so first up on my list is a game from Capcom Magic Sword I recently played the arcade port of this during a live stream and I don't remember ever having played that game before. And then I discovered there was a Super Nintendo version of it and I immediately bought a copy of it. Now I don't care how you play these games, emulate them, play them on original hardware, flash carts. Most of these games I'm playing on flash cart, by the way. But this one I absolutely loved. So the arcade game originally released in 1990. Then a couple years later, it was released on the Super Nintendo and I just wasn't aware of it. So with this game, your objective is to defeat the evil Lord Drachmar by climbing up his uh, 50 floors of his tower, getting to that 51st floor and you finally get to fight him. So along the way, you fight plenty of different enemies, a bunch of different, you know, variety of environments within the tower. Being that it's just a tower, to me it was kind of surprising the amount of variety there is with the terrain. That's a pretty straightforward game. You know, it's very simple. You have a basic attack and jump. Allowing a moment between your attacks will charge up your attack and you can like shoot a projectile depending on the weapon you're using. Now there are quite a few single use items and different weapons you could find from chests and whatnot. Plus there's tons of keys. You'll find keys all over the place in this game. And the keys do come in handy as you can open locked doors like little jail cells and whatnot. And you'll be greeted by an NPC follower who will help you along the way. Now each time you open a new door, you can trade out the little NPC character you're using for whoever, you know, came out of that cage or that room, uh, if you if you want to use them, right? Now, the NPCs that you get, you can only have one at a time. They can be powered up throughout the game by finding blue hearts, which is a single-use item, or by finding that same NPC again that'll power them up. They each have their own balance between speed, attack, strength, and health. Now, I think it's a, a really neat aspect of the game. Now, Magic Sword, it has two different endings, which are just based on your final choice that you make once beating the final boss. I thought that was a, a neat little touch, but not really that big of a deal. It's still kind of cool to have that. I mean, it was an arcade game, works the same way it did in the arcade. Now, with the Super Nintendo port, it's not as polished as the arcade version. You know, obviously some of the animations, the, the artwork, just... The overall game, it's kind of, you know, it's shrunk down a bit. It still has all the levels. You can choose to start at a different level of the tower if you just want to bypass a bunch of it, which is kind of interesting that they give you that. It's kind of almost like a difficulty option, but more of like, oh, you don't want to start from the bottom. You want to start, you know, 10, 13 floors up, halfway through, uh, you know, the last quarter of the way. So you do have that option if you just want to skip through it. The game can be a little monotonous. I mean, same thing over and over again, fighting enemies, getting to the end of the stage, but it's a very short game, even with the 50 floors and then the final boss, you can beat this game in under an hour if you're just persistent, just playing through it from the first floor to the top. I still find it a very fun game to play. And it's just that simple arcade action at home that I really enjoy. Next up on my list is Clock Tower. Even if you've never played a Clock Tower game, I I'm sure plenty of you have heard the name before. The Super Nintendo version was never released outside of Japan, but there are fan translations available, which is how I played using a flash cart. Clock Tower, it was an interesting experience the first time I played it. I did recently stream through the game, beating it once on my channel here. It took me nearly three hours to complete my first playthrough, so I just wasn't prepared. I really didn't know what I was getting myself into. Clock Tower, it's a survival horror point and click adventure game where you play as an orphan named Jennifer who's newly brought into the Barrows family along with several other girls. I'm not a huge fan of point and click adventure type games these days, but this one, it just intrigued me. 
It's a freaky ass game. The atmosphere does an excellent job of letting you know that. The different rooms, scenarios, characters, and sounds within this game, it really does draw you in. For being a Super Nintendo game, I think it does an excellent job of being part of that horror genre, you know, early on. The game, it has like a randomness to it that can be frustrating on your first playthrough. I mean, if you really don't know what to expect, the randomness may not be apparently noticeable that it's random, but if people are trying to like guide you like, oh, you have to do this and everything's random. Yeah, it could be a little, you know, frustrating. Some of the rooms are randomized. The item placements are as well. So the game, it's really meant to be replayed. There's a lot of replayability here as there's eight different endings. After my first playthrough, I finished the game again a couple more times, these times a lot quicker because I, I knew what to expect. But each time the game was pretty different and I thought that was pretty cool. Never knowing when Scissor Man or Scissor Boy, like I like to call him, was going to pop out definitely keeps you on edge. This, is, this was a weird one. If you like weird, you may like this one as well. The controls, I feel they're a bit better than your typical point and click type game in my opinion. You can use the L and R buttons to walk or run in those directions. Use the Y button to click on objects or doors or to move in whichever direction you want. Pressing the X button will stop you from walking, you know, kind of mid walk, just kind of freeze you, you know, just stop whatever action you're doing. The A button allows you to select an item in your inventory, which this is very important for this type of game because a lot of trial and error trying to find items, use different items. Uh, it's not overly crazy. A lot of things do seem fairly apparent on what you need to do with them, but some things can throw you for a loop. And, you know, it does take a little getting used to with these controls, but I, I feel it does work very well, better than your typical, like, let me just point an arrow at something and click on it. So I, I definitely like that. I'm glad I gave this one a chance. You know, taking a different approach each playthrough and getting different results and endings was really an enjoyable experience with this one. Well worth it. The playthrough or multiple playthroughs anyway next up on my list is first samurai one of the most generic names i've ever heard i'm not even sure how i was drawn to this but i recently discovered this game while just randomly selecting games on my super nintendo flash cart now this game was originally released for the amiga and atari st it was later ported to the C64, DOS, and Super Nintendo. The game does have that 90s British game design aesthetic going for it, if you know what I mean. Well, it, it is a UK developed game after all, so I guess that's kind of obvious. But the game got me hooked right away with that aesthetic and just how the game plays. It's by no means a perfect game at all, very rough around the edges with certain things. Some of the sound effects can be a little grating over time. I, I, I feel like he says oof over and over again. I mean, maybe Tommy Tallarico needs to sue this guy too. I'm not sure. But the enemies, man, the biggest, the biggest con I have with this game is the enemies continually respawning is freaking awful. Makes the game needlessly difficult at times. But overall, it's still a unique experience. Has a little bit of everything going on. Some platforming, beat em up action, a bit of strategy thrown in, some puzzle solving. And, you know, with the controls and how the main character moves and attacks, it's, it's very satisfying with the way they developed this game. You could jump, punch, kick, use a sword, throw axes, and become more powerful over time as you progress through the game. Now, the environments, they're kind of strange. I really have no clue what the hell's going on here. It seems like you, you're, like, fighting demons, monsters, maybe some aliens in feudal Japan. I mean, why the hell not, right? The weirdness and uniqueness of this game, it just keeps drawing me back in. This is the one game on my list that I haven't completed yet, but I constantly think about it and want to go back and play some more. Check it out. It's a cool one. Hagane, The Final Conflict. This one definitely deserved a spot on my list today as I've played it quite a bit over the past few years in different product review videos where I'm testing things for the Super Nintendo. So for sure, this is one I highly recommend. Now, Hagane, it's one of those expensive Super Nintendo games that continues to rise in price over the years. And it's just pretty crazy nowadays, the price people want for this thing. I used to say just get the Super Famicom version if you're into physical media and one of the original cartridges as it's way cheaper and there's just very little in the way of text in the game anyway so you don't really have to read much 
but the Japanese release that's continued to see its price rise as well over the past few years. It's getting kind of crazy. So I've heard some people claim in the USA that this game was a blockbuster rental exclusive, which is why it's so pricey and rare, but I don't think this has ever been officially proven. I think it may have just been one of those games that had a smaller run at manufacturing and just kind of blended in at stores back then, but who knows? That's neither here nor there. Either way, I think it's an awesome ass game in my opinion. It obviously has some inspirations from Shinobi and Ninja Gaiden, but it's definitely its own game. You play as a cyborg ninja fighting against another ninja clan. Tons of moves, flips, weapons, magic abilities, and more. I mean, you could just kind of go through the game without ever doing much in the way of using different moves. You could just use your blade the whole time. But once you discover there's a lot more to it, it does get a little bit more fun and strategic with the way you approach certain things. There's just so much to it. It's crazy. The game just has tons of stuff going on. Maybe it could have been a little more refined in certain areas, but overall I think it's an excellent game that I would have loved to play back in the 90s if I knew about it. Maybe would have bought like 50 copies of it to you know hold on to and, and sell for tons of money in the 2021. I, I don't freaking know. But the action in this game, it's nonstop. You really have no time to like stand around and look around. You just keep moving forward. The game story, it, it's kind of interesting, not interesting. It depends on how you look at it. A lot of these games, you just want to play. You don't really give two craps about what's going on in the game. This is one of those. You don't really have to care about what's going on to enjoy it. But it's pretty much a ninja version of Robocop. You know, you're Hagane going after the clan who killed your clan and left you for dead. You know, if you've never played this one, I highly recommend giving it a shot if you loved games like Shinobi and Ninja Gaiden back in the 80s and 90s. Well worth a playthrough today. Demon's Crest, another Capcom game on my list. So this one you may be familiar with, or at least know the main character Firebrand as he's been in several games prior to this. Gargoyles Quest 1 and 2 and more famously, the Ghost and Goblins series of games. So you play as Firebrand on a quest to rule the demon realm after having all of the crest elements taken from you by Phalanx, another demon looking to rule the demon realm. It's all about ruling shit. So this game was one that I, I remember seeing but just never playing back in the 90s. And I, I really love how this game starts out with you being chased by a dragon, fighting it before the start of the first level, the graphics and sound design are awesome and really set the tone of this game. You know, kind of having that darker tone. You're in the demon realm. Come on now. So going into the overworld map. Yeah, there is an overworld map. And it's in that like mode 7 3D style that was really cool. It reminded me of flying around in the airship in Final Fantasy 3. I, I thought that was a neat aspect of the game. So Demon's Crest, it, it does allow you to replay levels as often as you like. Because as you progress through the game and you get more abilities from getting the crests back, you can access new areas, items, and bosses in each stage. So it is kind of cool going back and checking stuff out. Figuring out ways to progress by using different abilities you, you know, unlock by getting those crests. It's, it's part of the fun, you know, just trying to see how you can approach things differently. There are some mini games to play in the game and overall the controls feel really good. It's a decent challenge, not overly difficult, but I really did enjoy this one. The graphic style, everything about it. It was a really awesome game. I mean, it's very polished in my opinion. Not much to complain about or nitpick. I really enjoyed this one and highly recommend it. So there you go. Those were five games that I didn't play back in the day, but I kind of discovered later on in life, past the lifetime of the Super Nintendo. The Super Nintendo is not dead, my friends, but you know what I mean. The system was awesome and there's tons of games to discover, especially ones that you just never heard of or even played. Some of these games you may have heard of, some of them you may have not, but I just wanted to give you guys a little list of games worth checking out. So really do appreciate it. And with that said, I will catch you guys on the next one. Peace out, bye-bye and boom, bye.